Hello and a warm welcome to the Public India. I'm Neelu Vyas. Post Ram Temple consecration ceremony, a lot of political water has flown down the country. Political switches have happened, alliances have broken, people have been forced to join BJP with enforcement agencies being unleashed on them, especially the opposition leaders. And Modi, Prime Minister Modi, claiming on the floor of the parliament that he's very confident of BJP winning 370 seats. Where is the opposition? And is BJP likely to cross the 400 mark as the claims made by the Prime Minister? Which way is the political wind blowing? Joining me now is image and brand guru uh, Dilip Cherian. Thank you so much, uh, Dilip, for joining. And uh, what is your assessment? Uh, as, uh, my pleasure having you on the program. But what is your assessment, Dilip, as far as uh, the political winds are blowing? And do you think that it's really a cakewalk for BJP in 2024? To me, Nilu, the cakewalk to a majority looks more than likely. The numbers may be worth arguing about. But there is no doubt, given the current sweep of waters which are flowing down at a higher uh, volume than ever before, that the BJP is leaving no stone unturned in its drive to make sure that its numbers are secure. Now, this implies that their own assessment is that they need to move the all the boulders for the water to flow in the direction and in the volume that they wanted to. So that's my first point, that the BJP is removing boulders, i.e. making sure that they uh, get opposition people back into their fold or are forced into their fold, as you said. And that's a sign that they internally know that the numbers are not easy to reach. That's one. Second, you know, I think that political parties move the needle to their advantage before elections. And certainly the kind of changes that have happened now indicate that certain vote banks are being shifted en masse. But, but people, you know, don't, people don't move en masse. We need to understand that what we, what we are talking about, the wholesale attempt to, to get and grab votes may not eventually reflect in how people want to respond on election day. So that's the second point, that people don't necessarily move with their party leaders. I'll stop and wait wait some more, some more for your questions so that I'm, we are moving in the right direction. Right. But uh, uh, Dilip, uh, what I want to ask you is that, uh, you know, we can see Prime Minister Modi's hunger for power. He will go any length to uh, uh, to uh, bring in the opposition to his side to break uh, the india alliance and uh, uh, and and, and the, this autocratic behavior which is seen uh, are the people not getting moved by this are people not able to see these autocratic moves by by the prime minister and uh, time and again we've seen that india has slipped way far below on the democracy index uh, I'm, I'm just asking you a question that are the people really not worried about uh, the democracy sliding down in the country? That's a good question. I don't really have an answer to that. I think the real answer is that today the country and the people seem to want, like and revel in the fact that they have a strong leader. Talk to the average Indian on the metro and they have a sense of pride that their country is now regarded as strong, their leader is regarded as invincible and they like that feeling. This to my mind is a new kind of public response. What you're talking about Nilu, about people being concerned about the levels of either democracy or perceived autocracy, I think those kinds of people are either not expressing themselves or perhaps the majority has shifted 
in its way of thinking. That difference is something that will show up at the polls, but there is no doubt that today in terms of public expression, it seems to be more in terms of, hey, we have a strong India. We have a big leader. We have a leader who dominates the global stage. So that right. rhetoric seems to be dominating at the moment. No, but like in yesteryears, uh, people were swayed by factors like price rise, unemployment, inflation. People used to say that, you know, any government can uh, fall down from the saddle if economic issues are raised up. At least that was the perception in the earlier years. But are people not really worried about things like price rise, things like unemployment? But there is a palpable sense on the ground that people do get disturbed when the prices, there is a price hike or there is some inflation. Economically, the country is not doing well. But are these not the driving factors anymore when it comes to the voting intention? You know, the, the level of pain at the grassroots level has been seriously addressed by the freebie system that we have installed in the country. The fact that people today feel entitled to housing, free education, and rations in their home is a new kind of delivery system. And money is reaching many of them in the banks at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, I think that this pain is genuine. Uh, when I sit on company boards, I hear conversations about the slowing down of rural demand over the last 10 quarters. Not one quarter, not two quarters, 10 quarters. So as rural demand falls, there is absolutely a, a high probability that there is pain at the bottom of the pyramid. The farmer's strike is one more visible example. The fact that there are protests, small but and sporadic, when there is a price in the uh, a hike in the price of gasoline, is also something that we have come to terms with. But having said that, there has been a perceived control of inflation at most levels and in most products. So the the kind of revulsion, the kind of pushback is not at the same level that we would have thought we would see at the end of 10 years of the same regime. But uh, Dilip, what, what I'm wanting to ask you is that uh, there are protests happening uh, and, and, and the protests also do not get covered that much by the by the large section of the mainstream media. Now, is that one factor where, you know, people have not been able to form their opinions? Because normally we have seen that media is that one section of the society which, which is an opinion maker. But when factors like price rise, when factors like inflation do not become part of the, op uh, the opinion making uh, ecosystem, then what happens? Are we to blame media for this? Are we to blame the people for this? And uh, people are just happy with having one strong leader, that is Narendra Modi. Is, is, is that the solution for the country? That you will just have one strong leader and then all the problems of the country get resolved? Is that where the people are heading to? I think the fact of media is something that we need to dwell on for a minute. Um, media has been very, very controlled over the last few years. And the levels of control are such that traditional media no longer has the ability, the strength or the confidence to report in the way that they used to some years ago. It is not that media controls are coming for the first time. Every strong yes. regime has attempted to muzzle the media. And this is no exception. But the fact is that the lack of a of a informed democratic public could be a constraint which you are talking about however the point of difference that we need to understand is that today's 
young voter, and I mean by young, from 18 to 38 or 40, is actually a, a generation that has grown without traditional media. They look to YouTube, they look to WhatsApp, they look to uh, cut and paste jobs of TikTok, Reels, etc. for all their news. So what is controlled is traditional media. What is uncontrolled is the kind of new media which has sprung up and people are searching there for the information that they sense but are not seeing on real media. Right. But uh, what happens to the polity of the country in this kind of a scenario? And this scenario, of course, is not very good. People do say that, you know, democracy remains, you know, now just exists in 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 a very academic uh, 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 ecosystem. People do not think what actually, what are the dangers if you tend to lose this democratic fiber, which is, and there are not one, but many examples to say that India is sliding towards autocracy gradually and slowly it is moving away from its democratic ideals and as i as i said there are not one but many examples of that so are we to arrive at the conclusion that people have started loving autocracy in the name of a strong leader who is your prime minister my sense nilu is that we are far from that situation there there has been some backsliding there have been many reasons for that. As I said, the fact that we've had weak and perce perceptionally weak prime ministers, as an image person, I can tell you that the brand of the previous, you know, several prime ministers has resulted in young people saying, we don't have a, a champion. You know, we are playing in the league of democracy, but we don't have a champion. Now, in the process of creating a champion, certain parts, certain fundamental elements of democracy may be trampled on, but people at the moment have had that hunger. It's been expressed. Is that going to stay? I think people's instinct for democracy is stronger. So I see a return to strong democratic values. Maybe, as I said, it's going to be dormant for a while, but I don't give up on the spirit of the average Indian. All right. So this kind of a scenario as what we have discussed, where does it take Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the moment? He, of course, remains the most popular Prime Minister. All the surveys have shown. Uh, as, as compared to other Prime Ministers, he remains the most popular leader. But uh, he not giving a, playing, a level playing field to the opposition, where does that position Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Very strongly. The fact that you are strong enough to bludgeon your opposition into um, silence and is also, don't forget that it is aided and abetted by sheer incompetence on the part of the opposition, hmm. by attacking the wrong things, by not being organized enough, by not having planning. You know, you cannot plan on things just at the last minute. I'm not saying make them public, but there is no planning. That worries me. When a strong leader is opposed by a bunch of pygmies, then we are in danger. No, but people do say that when you have a strong fascist leader, an opposition calls uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi as a fascist leader. So if you have a fascist force in front of you and a weak opposition, who, which has not planned, which has not organized itself. So uh, would it be fair to say that opposition is really wrong at this point of time? Now, say, for example, I'm just giving you one example that the accounts of uh, the Congress party have been frozen, just raking up an old income tax case, whereas the uh, political parties are not really entitled, uh, you know, to, to, give up, um, uh, to show up their income tax. So that is one example. Then breaking the economic spine of the political parties, breaking their leaders, that could be a strategy of the BJP, but then what does the opposition do at this point of time? You know, I'm, um, I'm someone who focuses on brand. And the ability to build up a brand with very little money, but with enough mass support has been demonstrated time and time again. 
whether it's Anna Hazare, whether it's uh, Jay Prakash Narayan, whether it's a whole bunch of leaders. The fact is you're able to build up an opposition on a shoestring. Do you see them? Try, do you see anyone in the opposition trying to do that? The sad answer is that most of them are content to make noises in public, blame the media, expect uh, that they will not be uh, targeted and continue their life of leading small bands of people. But the idea of appealing, creating a brand, making sure it stands for something which people want seems to be something they've taken a break from. Will that continue? I'm not sure. My sense is that always when times are dark, a, a, a ray of light comes in from an unexpected source. Right. So uh, are, you, are you sure that this time, uh, as what Prime Minister Modi has been claiming, that NDA is going to cross the 400 mark and he's very, very confident that BJP will, will almost get 370 seats and that's what he's claimed on the floor of the House? You know, we started with that question and I'm glad we are ending with that. Uh, my sense is that the BJP will find it difficult to cross the 350 mark, even, even get to the 350 mark. So I think the 370 mark is what is called a, a, a target raising exercise, which any leader must do to keep his own party enthused and working harder. All right. But there are a lot of uh, citizen movements happening, say, for example, on EVMs, that uh, EVMs can be manipulated, EVMs can be tampered, and there is a nationwide uh, uproar on this. A lot of citizen movements are happening across this. Now, do you think that factors like these could impact uh, the voting uh, pattern in the, for, the, for the forthcoming elections? You know, my sense is that the judgment in the Chandigarh case... Hmm is going to make the hands of those who want EVMs strong. Because you saw on camera a returning officer manipulating the results. Uh, I tend to believe that we should go back to a paper ballot because that is where the world has decided a safer option exists. Now, again, if you wanted to raise an EVM issue, I think the month of February and the even if it started in January or earlier is too late. It should have started much earlier, just after the last elections. Right. You mentioned about uh, the Chandigarh polls. That, of course, has shown that how the presiding officer just became a pawn and he was working under directions and he manipulated the whole election. But just before that, we had a big verdict on electoral bonds and uh, I'm talking specifically about corruption, that all the allegations that, you know, all the money was being donated to BJP. Do you think that verdict has really broken uh, the BJP spine, uh, the economic spine? And also, has it exposed BJP in the eyes of the public with this big verdict on electoral bonds? I, um, at, the, at the risk of being contrarian, I think, Nilu, that the electoral bonds judgment actually makes things easier for the BJP. Okay. With, with greater levels of transparency being available to the citizen now, to the voter, they will be more, business will be more scared of giving to any party other than the ruling party. So to my mind, this is a sword that can cut either way. And at this point of time, the sword is going to cut the opposition more than it's going to cut the BJP. Absolutely. So uh, as of now, how do the things look like? 2024, you said, is, is definitely not going to be very easy. You yourself said that BJP might not cross the 350 mark. But uh, what ha happens to the opposition then? Where do you see the opposition sitting? As what Prime Minister Narendra Modi said during the president's address when he was uh, giving a reply to the, to, the, uh, to the motion of thanks to the president, he said that opposition will soon be seen in the spectators' gallery. Now, is that where we are seeing the opposition in the coming days? If they don't get organized, if they don't get unified, if they don't recognize the power of brand building, 
from day one, instead of looking for day 98 to begin, that chance is very high. They have to get, they have to realize that every setback is an indication that they must start working even harder, faster and earlier. Right. But when you spoke about the brand value, I also want to talk to you about uh, 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 Rahul Gandhi's brand uh, in, in, the, in the last lap of our questions. Where do you see Rahul Gandhi really headed to with the Bharat Jodo Nyayatra, the second leg, then the first leg happened, it positioned himself well. What happens to him now? Uh, and how do you see the brand value of Rahul Gandhi evolving? I think Rahul Gandhi has a great future if he's better briefed and surrounded by smarter people. Okay. I think he really has a problem today. If you see in the last lap of the Nyaya Yatra, hmm. he has been called out for being sexist about Aishwarya Rai. He has been called out for attacking a journalist when he wants to attack the owner. I think these are errors that cannot be made by a person who by now should be a seasoned warrior. Mm -hmm. That's one. The okay. second, you can't become a one-trick pony and expect a yatra to amp your visibility every time. You need to have new tricks. And I'd like to see those new tricks. All right. So if Rahul Gandhi, you feel, has still not matured uh, enough and maybe he's not briefed properly because of the people surrounding him, where do you see Congress? Is Congress really going in the pits? Or you see some kind of a revival sign within Congress with Malikarjun Kharge also at the helm of affairs? You know, while I still do a lot of branding and communication work in the political space, Neelu, uh, I'm not the kind of person who tries to come up with either numbers or uh, uh, calls election seats because that is not my speciality. My speciality is somewhere else. On the Congress, what number of seats they'll get, whether they'll get more than last time, is up in the air. It really depends on whether the party cadre are enthused enough by Yatra hmm. 1 and Yatra 2 to actually man the booths and get their voters who exist. The fact is that the Congress is the largest opposition party in the country. They have to get those votes to the polling booth. If they can, then they'll do well. All right. So uh, one last question before I wind up uh, the interview. So uh, you, you said JP looks difficult in crossing 350 marks. So any guesses towards the campaign which is going to build up in the coming days? What are the factors which you really see in the coming elections? Or uh, it's, it's only going to be all about Ram Mandir. It's going to be about Article 370, which BJP will keep Tom Toming. And uh, opposition will not really have some issues to talk about. Is it? Is it? Uh, it's what is not, the final incentive you see? It's not going to be Ram Mandir or 370. It's going okay. to be Brand Modi. And Brand Modi will lead from the front. Brand Modi will be an aggressive brand. And Brand Modi will be the dominant brand of election season 2024. Just the persona of a man who guarantees to deliver. It will be Modi ki guarantee all the way. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Cherin. It was wonderful having you on the program. And one appeal to the viewers who are watching this interview, subscribe to our channel, send us your feedback, and stay tuned to Public India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.